was just wondering, how did you, how do you kind of get involved as a sports psychologist in the NFL? Was this something that you had always planned on being growing up and through high school, or was it kind of something that you maybe came about just through schooling and stuff and, and the situation presented itself? Yeah. So my journey, I think, is a little bit different than others. Um, but uh, I was an athlete playing uh, soccer mm -hmm. throughout most of my life at a pretty competitive level. And so I always had a great relationship with sport and really, um, you know, most of my relationships growing up and everything else was funneled through sport. And so sport always had a high level of meaning. Um, but I transitioned away from sport and found a new passion, which was psychology. I was um, starting at the age of 19. I was working in psychiatric hospitals for troubled youth, wow. um, outward bound programs, and uh, ended up going and getting a a uh, dual degree, a, a double PhD. So I got two PhDs for the price of two PhDs. One, yeah. was, in, one was in clinical psychology and the other was in school psychology. Yeah. Just in and case so one, I, just in case one wasn't, wasn't hard enough. Right. Cause obviously. Right. And, and so um, what was interesting about that was my goal was primarily to work in children's psychiatric centers. Mm -hmm. And so I thought the nice thing about the school degree and the clinical degree is if a child was acting out in class, was it due to a learning disability or oppositional defiant disorder? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just helping be a, a, a sharper instrument and resource for those that were in need. Mm -hmm. And while I was in graduate school, um, I started to re-engage in sport. I was a coach uh, for a youth team. And one of the players on the youth team, his father was a manager for a semi-pro soccer team. And he said, Hey, you know, I like what you're doing. Why don't you come on out? And I thought my prime, I was way past my prime, but mm -hmm. I went out there and found a love for it. And, um, and then I was trying to figure out, well, how do I combine these two? Kind of like, like, uh, I would only imagine the way Reese's peanut butter cup got invented. It was sort of like chocolate and peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I came across, this world of sports psychology. And so then as if those two PhDs weren't enough, mm. I um, went over to the exercise science department and started doing a lot of education and training and research through some of those professors. So I folded all three of those things in. Mm -hmm. And so um, I can't say that I had a master plan or a final destination. I was just following my passions. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's so common with, with a lot of things in life. And especially with athletes is, you know, athletes, they may have a plan, you know, I want to go play for this team, for example, and they grow up wanting to play for a certain team, but you know, it's only very rarely where things work out the way that you envision it to be in five or 10 years. And, and there's a degree of, you know, being, um, you know, I guess agreeable with change as it comes up. And, and that's probably hard for some athletes to deal with as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's an old Yiddish proverb, man plans, God laughs. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's interesting because sports is unscripted. Um, it, oftentimes how we go about planning or trying to control our outcome, um, it, it's almost like as if you're going on a road trip with a bunch of friends and you end up in um, New Orleans instead of Florida. And it's not mm -hmm. to say one's better than the other. It's just, wow, I didn't know what, this is where I was going to be. Mm -hmm. as, as a sports psychologist for a professional sports team, whether it's the, the NFL or NBA or, or another league, what, what's your day-to-day -day look like? Maybe we'll start off in the, in the regular season when the season's kind of going on. What's your day-to-day, -day, typical day looking like? Yeah, I mean, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just try to think about an average day. So the way that I've contracted and, and, and developed the employment. So we're kind of in a new age. So yes, there's been people who have been doing this for, for decades. But how they've been doing the work and how they've been defining the work has been very um, – nebulous. It's sort of all over the place. Um, so what you'll have is you'll have some individuals who are more motivational and more about trying to do performance excellence. And then you have others that are more like traditional clinical psychologists with confidentiality intact and maintaining some kind of focus really about mental health and wellness. And, and I guess for me in the 20 to 25 years I've been doing this, 
um, I've just found that that's more of a blend than a distinction. I just don't see it as binary. It's not either or. And, mm-hmm. and as a concrete example, um, if you think about someone who's struggling on the field, and that's a big part of their personal identity, and then they go home and they're irritable and maybe they're a little bit have a shorter fuse with their wife or their kids. And so, you know, their wife goes, man, you're so angry all the time. And they think that that's a clinical issue. We need to have you see a therapist. And it's like, well, okay, well, which is it? Like, is Mm -hmm. it that you're angry or is it more about, gosh, if I could only just play better on the field, that would, that would get rid of this offshoot. And so it always becomes this, again, chicken and the egg kind of dilemma. Mm -hmm. So going back to your question, to answer it specifically, Mm -hmm. the way that I folded the contract was not just to be a clinician and not just to be a performance person, but to actually be both. So the way that I like to think about it is a full spectrum of care that's on a horizontal plane, but then I also have a full spectrum of care that's on a vertical plane too. And by vertical, it's being a resource for the players, the coaches, the front office, the head coach, vice president, the GM, and even ownership if they so choose. Mm -hmm. So um, in a lot of ways, I've I've tried to come up with a way to shorten it and make it a really cool kind of title or distinction. The closest I've come so far is it's it's an embedded model, a 360 degree embedded model. So what does it look like on a day-to-day basis? I show up, I attend all staff meetings. I attend all team meetings. Uh, With the NFL team, I go to install meetings, which is where they're teaching about the playbook for the week. And then um, I'm a resource. So a lot of times it's a player that comes up and goes, hey, doc, you got a second. And that can be something as simple as, can you give me a quick hitter um, so I can be ready for the day or the week? And other times it's, could I talk to you about something that's going on in my personal life? And then it's, yeah, let's come to my office and we'll talk. Uh, same thing. It could be where a coach says, you know what? I just can't seem to get this thing across this one point across to, to my position room. And that's where that school psychology kicks in. Or then it can also be a relationship dynamic where, um, you know, a coach might say, Hey, here's something that's going on in my room where one player is off task and uh, it's affecting the other players in the room. Mm -hmm. And and then it can also be um, even more of a global kind of thing where um, a head coach or a GM might say, Hey, can you help me with a particularly difficult decision that I have to make? Mm -hmm. So are you part of a a team of of psychologists for, for a sports organization or are you acting by yourself? At this point, it's just me. Um, I do. It's interesting because I've had the opportunity to help both um, NCAA uh, division one schools as well as pro teams develop and design and create. And the first question that I ask is, do you want a person? So we focus on a job description or do you want a program? And they often will come back to me and go, well, what's the difference? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, a program is a lot more all encompassing. It's where you have a staff. It becomes something where maybe you have specialists, like a performance specialist and a clinical specialist, um, that kind of concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, 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 I really like how you mentioned how there, there's such an interaction between life and sports and things that happen in sports affect your life and things that happen in life affect your sports. I see it so many times when I, um, consult with some of the youth athletes that I have that, you know, if, if they're feeling, um, not confident in their game or, you know, they're being tentative or something that usually translates to them being tentative in life. Or if they have, um, some trouble, maybe calming themselves down or dealing with uh, adversity during a game, then they have trouble dealing with adversity in, in their life more often than not. So I really want to kind of hammer down that point for people to understand that, you know, what goes on and the, the mental things you work on in sports will help you in, in life overall. And I like to look at sports as a tool for people to, to grow their character, I guess, or to grow their mental game and in a sense to, to just, um, I guess, translate those skills to, to real life. Yeah, it's, it's always about microcosms versus macrocosms, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's not just sports, but also things like music. So if your kids are in a band, they still have to work out how to deal with conflict. Hey, I want to play this way. No, I want to play it that way. And same thing in sport, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, hockey, where, you know, um, 
maybe one of the teammates makes a mistake and it's how do you navigate through that? Are you supportive? Are you combative? Do you blame? Do you shame? Um, you know, I think this becomes a really interesting um, mechanism or tool, to, you know, to your point. One of the points that I'll often make with parents is I'll talk about how sport is really just an opportunity mm -hmm. um, for human behavior and human interaction to evolve and grow in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's a lot of opportunities for that. Like when you think of working as a team or being a leader or listening, following instructions, doing something you don't want to do. It's all those, those human behavioral skills that, you know, some of them probably you only get experience with it in sports for, for most people. And I think it's really crucial for, um, I always recommend for, for youth to play some sort of competitive sports when they're growing up. So they're get exposed to different social situations that then when they become an adult, um, they're not so new to them and they have a bit of, bit better understanding of how to uh, react to these situations, I guess. Like for example, losing a lot of there's obviously the huge debate of like a participation trophy versus not a participation trophy and teaching kids how to lose. Yeah, it's funny. I find that that pendulum in the child development theory mm -hmm. within sport, that pendulum swings to the everybody gets a trophy. Now it has no value. No, we should help people develop and learn a resilience to disappointment as well as having value and merit in the uh, notion of working hard warrants uh, uh, some form of reward or acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't think there's a right answer there, For but sure. it is interesting to watch how we react. Yeah. I, I also think the role of the adults who are supervising or participating in, in the activity becomes really, really important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, when I think of like an NFL or not NFL, it could be NFL, NBA, any professional sport, I guess. There's a, there's an off season and then like the regular season, right? And so there's a bit of a, a downward peak, I guess, in team activity, so to say. Someone like a coach or GM, they're of course on the ball 24-7. You don't really have a week off or something. It, for someone in your position, is there a, a peak season of psychology consulting, so to say? And do you have down times as part of your work with some teams? Or is it um, more so like a coach or a GM where, you know, it's it's... 24 7 365 i wouldn't call it 24 7 365 though you do have to have a level of availability for when those people who are 24 7 365 because um as is common in sport if uh if they go hey you know where's goldman where's goldman oh he's not here who's next down the bench mm -hmm. and again in the world of professional sports, especially, we are conditioned to be on a shot clock. In the NFL, it's a sprint to Sunday. In the NBA, there's a 24-second shot clock. You know, like, so there is always this sense of sprinting to a deadline. And so there isn't a lot of time to stop and go, well, we got to wait for Goldman because he's committed to some other, you know, uh, co he's committed to some other event or he's on vacation or something like that. Like, it just doesn't kind of work that way. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a, a level of constant readiness and, and preparedness to be a valued resource. With that said, I think what I would call it is not so much being in or out of season, but rather a task shift. So for example, during the regular season, it's a lot more about stress management, especially as you're winning and losing during this out of season shift, not off season, because I just don't think there's ever an off season, but during the out of season shift, it might be more about assessing and, and evaluating talent. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no bigger stage to assess or uh, evaluate talent than the NFL Combine, which which just went on a couple of weeks ago. I know that you were there yourself a bit. How crazy was that week for you or, or a couple of weeks, whatever the length of time you were um, in Indianapolis for? Yeah, it's um, it can get pretty intense. Um, so, you know, uh, I actually serve two roles. Uh, I have a partner. His name's Jim Bowman. He and I created a company called Athletic Intelligence Measures, and we invented a test. We created a test called the AIQ, Athletic Intelligent Quotient, and the AIQ is um, it's a sports-specific cognitive ability measure. So let's see if I can kind of untangle that a little bit because that's a lot of hmm. multi-syllable words. Um, what we did was is we created a, a measure that assesses how people solve the unsolvable puzzle of sport. 
So if you think about the idea of you step on a field and now you've got to react in live time to constantly changing and evolving stuff. So if just use the NFL as a specific example, and we'll use the quarterback position being how important it is. Quarterback first, you know, gets the play. So right there is one cognitive ability. How do we download that information during installs through the week? Then how do we recall it once it's, you know, sent into his uh, headset? Then he has to approach the line and read the defense. Again, that's the visual spatial processing task. So he's reading and analyzing the defense. Where are people setting up? Um, you know, are, is he accurately labeling the mic read, which is to say, is he identifying the person who kind of clues into how the defense is about to um, engage in whatever play is called? Then the snap starts and the quarterback has to go through his progressive reads. Again, another cognitive ability. Then he has to make a decision. Do I run? Do I hand the ball off? Do I pass the ball, et cetera? And sometimes that's executing from a recall, the play that was called, or it's about improvising in live time. Hey, wait a minute, the play we called is not a good match for what's unfolding. Now I got to improvise, which again, these are all aspects of intelligence. And, so, and they're, all, they're all occurring in split seconds. Yeah. 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 You listed five or six or seven different behaviors there. And for a quarterback, I mean, it's like maybe at first glance, if somebody wasn't familiar with football, like you would think they have a, a bit of time to go through the, the progressions, reading the defense, reading where the safeties are, cover two, cover three, whatever it is. Um, but these are all split second decisions. Exactly. And, and it's interesting because, you know, though luck is always heavily involved in sports, there is certain folks where you're kind of going, isn't it interesting that they seem to constantly find their way out on top? And, and I think that there's a, there's, um, this is way oversimplified, so forgive me on this, but I think there's essentially four buckets, right? There's four buckets to the athletic profile. There's the physical bucket, which is easy to measure, size, strength, speed. There is uh, your knowledge bucket or your experience bucket, right? Which is, you know, again, grabbing a defensive lineman from Clemson. You kind of know what you're getting because of how good that school is at producing defensive linemen. So what they know and where they came from, what kind of defense or offensive system they came from in college. Then the third bucket is intelligence, which again is what the AIQ measures, the ability to acquire, apply, and process information. And then there's this fourth bucket, which is personality, character, work ethic, et cetera. And so my role at the Combine is twofold of these four. So I don't do, I don't break down game film or anything like that. That would be the experience bucket. I don't uh, really care or invest time or energy into measuring their wingspan or their hand size or any of that stuff. That's the physical, but I do spend time. So um, this year we were contracted by seven NFL teams to collect the AIQ data and review the AIQ data with them. Um, and then with the team that I am contracted with, I provide um, personality assessment where I'll, I'll use some of my psychological training to help try to understand the player and, and uh, conceptualize the player. Is he a good fit for our culture, et cetera. Mm -hmm. For the AIQ, is it, um, developed in a way that there's multiple AIQs for different positions in football, or is it just one overall encompassing um, test or evaluation? It's one test. So we followed the cattell horn carroll theory of intelligence, which is the predominant theory of intelligence used by uh, most intelligence tests out there. That would include the Woodcock-Johnson, the Stanford-Binet, the Wexler scales. So we spent 15 years in research and development making sure that we follow the American Psychological Association's ethical guidelines for test construction. So the test itself is pretty uniform and pretty set. Um, so that way we're accurately measuring the cognitive abilities that we are. But with that said, um, so the scores say the same, the abilities say the same, but how a quarterback uses it might be different than a um, – running back mm -hmm. and even within quarterbacks like you might have a mobile quarterback who emphasizes or needs certain cognitive abilities more than say a true pocket passer who might emphasize and need other cognitive abilities mm -hmm. so what we've got is 14 uh sorry we've got 15 
um, scores, 15 items that each provide detailed information about cognitive abilities. And then we help the teams understand what those mean. So that way they go, oh, this is a great fit. Like we like to play fast. So we're going to rely on this cognitive ability. Oh, we like to play strong. So we're going to rely on this cognitive ability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I have to imagine that um, just based on, you know, media perception of sports and the mental side of sports, there's obviously, I would say in the last five or 10 years, a huge shift to focusing on the mental side of sports that maybe I, I remember growing up watching sports either because it wasn't as prominent or I just didn't have the right lens to look through, but I didn't really hear much about the mental side of sports like in, in the nineties and, and early two thousands, more so just recently. Um, have you noticed that as well as part of your, your NFL draft that, or whatever professional league, of course, that there's been more of a shift, um, especially with scouting players and evaluating them, a shift from going maybe 100% or 90% physical and 10% mental to maybe a more equilibrium between the two? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I would say that that's really like uh, team by team, not even mm -hmm. sport by sport, but really a team by team. So I think every team has their secret sauce or their secret algorithm of where they put emphasis. But I think one of the reasons why you're seeing the growth is um, if you look at things, and we'll just use the NFL, um, 30 years ago, the average NFL lineman weighed about 260 pounds. And now the average NFL lineman weighs well over 300. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is, is I think with nutrition and strength and conditioning, like we have kind of figured out really a level of mastery below the neck. What's interesting though is as much as we can cr increase power and, and output with muscle growth, there are still limits to the physical human body, for example, joints, right? So what you're seeing now is an increase in things like, you know, ACL tears, Achilles tendon tears and things. And that's because we're putting so much torque on those joints because we are generating so much strength. So if you think about it, there is like, um, there is sort of a, a curve that has a cost of diminished returns mm -hmm. where we're getting people really big, really strong, really fast. Well, okay, now they're all big. Now they're all strong. Now they're all fast. What's the next competitive advantage? Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you look at the literature, there is an argument that um, there's one research that came out that said that sports psychology can contribute as much as nine to 16% of performance output. Wow. And, and yeah, it's funny to me because some people hear that and they go, really? Only 9 to 16%. And other mm -hmm. people go, wow, 9 to 16%. That seems like a lot. And, and I would almost make the argument, I'm not even sure how you develop a study to really isolate where 9 or 16% is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and, you know, at, at that high level of professionals, I mean, the most elite level in the world, the, the NFL, for example, for football, at least. That nine to six, I mean, even just a 0.1 or 0.5%, you know, increase in performance, I bet you teams would do whatever they could to get even a 0.5% increase to be able to get nine to 13% increase, um, or at least nine to 13% of it um, is due to mental performance, for example. Um, that's in, in the grand scheme of things. Like you said, it seems like a small number, but but when you really think about, you know, at what, you know, nine to 13% increase of, of the most elite athletes in the world. That's, that's a huge gain and something that I think, um, like you said, a lot of NFL teams are striving for. Yeah. I mean, like, look, it's an Olympic year. So as right. we start to talk about the Olympics, think about how some of these races, track and field swimming, the distance between first and second is about three one hundredths of a second, which is right. about the length of a sneeze. And sometimes the distance even between first and fourth place. So you don't even medal mm -hmm. is the dis is the difference of like eight one hundredths of a second. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to your point, if you can increase your performance by even 1%, that could be the difference between getting, you know, getting a medal or, or not placing at all at the Olympic event. Similarly, and something I'll talk about with, with players in the NFL is I'll say, look, like as a quarterback, if you average 300 yards a game and you were able to improve it by 10%, now we're talking about you're throwing 330 yards a game. Mm -hmm. 
So if you think about the way the NFL is set up, which is about parity, which makes it very, very exciting, right? Most teams are designed to be nine and seven, seven and nine, and you can go from worst to first in, you know, in a blink of an eye, as you'll see every year, it's, it's interesting. They always kind of release like, Oh, six of the eight NFL teams didn't even make the playoffs the previous year. Like, yeah, the days of dynasties seem to be ending um, New England being an outlier. Yeah. And so what's interesting is inside the building, you will always hear a dialogue of, Oh man, well, if we only had gotten the first down against this other team in week three, we would have taken that momentum and we would have gone on a win streak or, Oh man, if we had just con- you know, just had converted that third down over there, or if we had not fumbled the ball, like there are always these like one or two sort of minor, minor events that we seem to think shift our whole season. Mm-hmm. And so I always make this argument of like, if we think the season comes down to these one or two minor events, are we doing everything we can to raise our, our average so that we're playing at a higher level? Mm-hmm. And I would argue too, I mean, one thing that I've encountered a, a bit with, with um, my own personal, I guess, athletic career or, or athletes that I consult with is they tend to only focus on or bring attention to the negative outcomes or like in those situations, like when you're thinking about like, Oh, I was one yard away from a first down there, or, you know, he was one inch away from getting both feet in bounds. Those are kind of the the, the negative outcomes, right. That hurt your season, but there's not really a focus on the flip side, the positive outcomes where, you know, that receiver made a really good catch. You who like got his feet in bounds by one inch, right. There there tends to be a a focus on, on the negative outcome. So I always try when I speak with some of my athletes, when I get them to self-reflect after games, I always get them to focus on positive and and negative outcomes, for example. So they're, they're forcing themselves to to think about the positive things. Another thing that I like to do as well, I'm not sure if if you had any experience with this or or your thoughts on it. Um, But you know, the whole process or the whole concept, I guess, of people being judgmental about themselves, like they think they're a good or bad player based on the outcomes of their game. And what I try to do with some athletes is shift their vocabulary from not looking at things as good or bad, but looking at them as wants or dis- or not wants or, or likes and dislikes to try and take away some of the value um, from their athletic performance. Because I find that for some athletes, when they attach a lot of value to their athletic performance, they get really, really high when they do something good or, or really, really down on themselves when they do something bad. But if, if you look at things of like liking or disliking, wanting or not wanting, it kind of takes some of that value out of it. Yeah, yeah. No, those are all great interventions. Mm-hmm. I mean, and there's nuggets in, in what you just said. There's tons of them of great nugget values. You know, so let's see if I can kind of peel back and reflect on some of what you said in certain key moments. So, you know, one thing is, I think it's important to recognize that as human beings, we are more hardwired to the negative, right? Mm -hmm. That if you think about from an evolutionary perspective, back in the day when we were all walking around the savannah, you know, was the stuff that could kill us that we always had to be on high alert for. You fall off a cliff, you get bit by a snake, you get attacked by a lion. So we, we have been hardwired to focus more on the negative than the positive. Um, you can go a day without eating. So yes, it's positive when you find an apple tree, but you can't go a day after being attacked by a lion. Mm-hmm. So, so there is almost a natural inherent part of uh, our, our wiring to think about things that are more than negative. Um, but to your point, I'll often use a comparable, which is, um, our appendix, which is, you know, we have this thing in our body that was meant to help digest, um, lignin, which is tree bark. So there was a time again, back in the Savannah where we used to eat tree bark. Uh, we don't anymore. And so we still have this genetic predisposition or this, this part of our body, this um, appendix that helps us do something that we don't do anymore. Same thing as us being somewhat hardwired more towards negativity at one point through our evolution was more beneficial than now. Mm-hmm. And that brings to the next part of what you were talking about, which is more of a transition to, I think, I think, you know, one thing that's nice about failure is it's an opportunity to reevaluate what went wrong. And to your point, um, and this is a slight shift because I think you were kind of talking about, hey, look, in all things, there's good and, po- and negatives and we can focus on both and take all into consideration. And I think that that's absolutely true. 
Um, it's just important to also note that they're not equal, right? Like right. Um, just because someone like Adolf Hitler was reported to be nice to his dog doesn't make that offset some of the horrible acts that he also committed. Right. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not equivalent to say, Hey, you know, yes, you lost the game cause you missed the game winning shot, but buck up. You also scored 25 points that kept your team close within winning. You know, it's like, yeah, but one doesn't negate the other. So to mm -hmm. accept that both our elements of the reality are important to recognize that we tend to think more towards the negative um, is important to evaluate and say, okay, now how do we correct this? What can we learn from it is important. And then to your point to sh shift over to the positive element and say, okay, now what did you do when you scored those 25 points? How did you digest that experience? What did you learn from it? I think also has a tremendous amount of value. So, um, it's funny how we tend to look towards the negative and only learn from the negative when we can also look towards the positive and learn from the positive. Then, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and then that leads to, I think, your, your, your next point, which is so brilliant, is the concept of separating an action, like shooting a basketball, from the role, i.e. being a basketball player, from the person, i.e. Dave or whoever that person might be, right? And so it's interesting because um, I was working with an NFL player who was talking about how he never really loved playing football. He was just really good at it. And I said, so how did that happen? Like, how did you even get involved? And he said, well, my dad worked hard. His dad was a blue-collar worker in a steel mill. And he only had one day off, which was Sunday. And the one thing he wanted to do was kind of sit on the couch and watch TV and watch the football games, mm -hmm. you know, watch his beloved team play. And so what was really interesting about it was here was this little kid, as he describes the story, kind of jumping in front of the screen, being like, hey, dad, let's go play or let's go do something. And, you know, the dad's going, look, I'm tired. I've worked six days. I just want to rest and watch this game. And so in a really kind of bizarre way, as this player described it to me, he came up with this idea that if I could get on TV if I could be in that football game, then my dad would notice me, then my dad would interact with me. So a mm -hmm. big part of this mechanism of this relationship dynamic between him and his father was this idea of if I'm good enough and I will work hard enough, I can, and that's, that was his primary motivation for getting into the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I worked with a, an Olympic athlete who had a similar kind of story. Her father was arrested the day she was born and she somehow throughout her training came up with this sort of fantasy mindset that was, if I run fast enough, daddy's going to come home to watch. So she mm -hmm. didn't quite understand the concept of jail as a kid, but she did understand that how much attention she got when she ran fast. And she thought if she ran just fast enough, her dad would hear about it and want to come see it. So, um, Again, going back to this idea of it becomes really hard to separate the person from the role, from the action, especially when the action really makes the role almost mythic or superhero like, oh, wow, like everybody knows who Dave is in high school because Dave's leading the team in points scored and then the person and and. And it's, it, this is where things get complicated as far as sense of self, because I think what's also important is um, there are some scenarios where there's an inverse relationship between mental health and performance. Once you stop trying to prove, once you try to stop winning your father's attention in those two examples, the NFL player and the Olympic athlete, once they said, hey, I no longer need that validation, because neither of them really love their sport, it, it it had the the risk of them not putting as much time or effort into perfecting their craft. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The one thing that I wanted to bring up after that that kind of struck me was, you know, I think there's somewhat of a perception that athletes they're in it for the money or for the fame and, and stuff like that. Like that's their motivating factor. But there's probably a lot of uncovered stories there, like you just mentioned. There's probably thousands thousands of them across the U.S. for professional sport athletes where they have some sort of combination or influence of, you know, their childhood and trying to 
please others or get somebody's attention or something. And I think it's just, it really speaks to maybe the, like how fragile maybe the mental side of the game is. And, and you're really dealing with these um, emotional situations and these, you know, you're really digging deep into a person's psyche and their, like their emotions, I guess. Yeah. And, and just how, how sensitive people's minds are and there's the core of themselves of why they go into sports for some people. It's really just eye opening, I guess, because it was some, wasn't something that I would normally consider as part of like an athlete's motivation to, to, to be a professional athlete is to get their parents' attention, for example. Yeah. And let's clarify, it's not all athletes like anytime. Right. right? But, but to your point, I think there is a lot more fragility so, you know, if you look at the theory like Erickson's disequilibrium theory, which talks about how child development comes from us being out of whack and then like, you know, learning to walk. So we stumble and we're all out of sorts and then we kind of grow up and level off and then we go out of whack and then we level off and grow. And so this development kind of tiering is how people grow. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting is sometimes certain developmental stages can be blunted or stunted because of um, sport. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, sometimes I'll ask people in the interview um, when I'm trying to assess culture fit and maturity and, and the personality factor in those four buckets is, you know, when did the rules change for you? When did people start treating you differently because of what you could do in um, sport? And so it's interesting because kind of like that movie, The Matrix, some rules are suspended, others are broken. When someone's super talented on the field, um, certain things can kind of shift. So uh, a good example of that might be um, a parent who now all of a sudden switches and thinks of their son as a golden goose. So when the son says, I don't want to do schoolwork, you know, the parent not wanting to jeopardize or risk that potential of being an NBA player or an NFL player says, okay, that's fine. No problem. And so um, there can be a, there can be an arrested development where people stop growing, you know, psychologically. So there's that fragility there, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think that there's also this mechanism of purpose and meaningfulness that I think is really important to assess, which is like, why do you do what you do? You know, um, a good example with football and basketball is because they have some physical dominance to them. Like in basketball, the taller you are, the, you know, the more, uh, attractive you become because seven footers are rare. Mm -hmm. The same thing like in football, 300 pound people who can really generate a lot of power on the offensive defensive line. That's, those, that's a valuable um, trait. So another question I ask is I'll say, you know, like, did you find football or did football find you? Mm -hmm. and, and this is not that uncommon where high school coaches will drive around poor neighborhoods just looking for big kids kind of hanging around and go, Hey, you know, like, have you ever played football before? You're, you're huge. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you hear people say, yeah. And so the, the team kind of pulled me on and, and sometimes it's like, Oh, and then I got into trouble, but the coach made that go away. And you know, like those kinds of elements. And so here they are just through their absolute freak genetic, almost, you know, like X-Men type, um, you know, that bucket of physical prowess. And here they are kind of going, I can't believe I made it all the way to becoming a millionaire. Right. And it was kind of easy, you know? Yeah. yeah. When, you, when you're interviewing athletes or you administer the AIQ, for example, at, at, a, at a combine, how do you balance the notion between if somebody scores low in a particular category or on the test, how do you know, how do you balance the notion of, um, you know, on one hand, you can look at it as, you know, they have a low score, like, we should maybe not consider them as much or they have a low score, but they have a lot of potential to improve and they may have other areas where they're really excelling in it. And you can kind of envision the things you would do to bring their mental game up. How, how do you kind of balance that, uh, I guess, dichotomy? Yeah. So, so um, I always try to remind people that sports is fluid and flexible mm -hmm. and therefore unpredictable. If we could predict sports, we might as well just go to Vegas or any of these other legalized gaming sites, right? Like the reason why I think, I think one of the reasons why we're drawn to it is it's, it's the ultimate reality television. We just don't know the outcome. I mean, it's even interesting, you know, with 
certain new analytics where they'll go, oh, this, per- this team's got a 93% chance of winning. And then, you know, a bunch of variables happen. Not to say the 93% was wrong. It's just a bunch of variables happen that kicked in the 7% mm-hmm. outcome. Mm-hmm. So I always like to start with that concept of like, look, with these four buckets, the two that I, that I sit in, I can't tell you to take anyone off the board, nor would I. Like, it's possible that these two buckets are deficient, but these other two buckets are so superior that it's worth it, you know? So, or these two buckets might be deficient, but good enough, plus these ones being superior. So, to me, it's really about the complexity of human behavior and human interaction. And it's really about the idea of being well informed. So it's not so much like, hey, that guy didn't score very well, take him off your board. It's more like, that guy didn't score very well. Now that you know that, is he still a good fit? So Mm -hmm. for example, let's say he's a defensive end who scores low on the AIQ. Maybe all you have him do is just rely on his physical ability, see ball, get ball kind of thing, versus having him kind of stunt up the middle or do something more complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, Similarly, like with the character stuff is it's like, all right, what kind of resources do we have available for him? Do we have the kind of locker room that can handle someone who might be a little bit off task or easily distractible? Do we have somebody who could mentor uh, the individual into becoming a really solid professional? Because I do believe human beings can grow all the time. And I like to think the best in folks. So uh, it goes back to this idea of, I see the role that I serve for the teams that I work for, both through the AIQ and just myself individually, is if I can help you um, lock on to a stronger signal, because I think there's always a difference between noise and signal, right? Like what's false information out there? What's, you know, I mean, there's plenty of teams that passed on Tom Brady, not just once, but five times. He's taken the sixth round, right? There's plenty of teams that passed on Russell Wilson, not just once, but three times. He's taken in the third round. Same thing with Lamar Jackson, last year's MVP. Every single team, all 31 teams passed on him except for the the Ravens. So um, there's always information out there that can be a distraction versus the signal of, yes, this is the right guy. This is our guy. And and I think the other part too is um, it's also not stable. For example, it's possible Tom Brady had been taken by some other team other than New England. He might not be Tom Brady. Same thing with Russell Wilson in Seattle or Lamar in in Baltimore. Like um, it's not just the individual, but also the environment and the relationship between the two. Yeah. You mentioned the the locker room in football and football is a really unique sport where there's 50, you have a 53 man roster. Um, So you have a huge locker room and I'm wondering maybe, I guess I never really considered when evaluating, when teams evaluate players, of course they look at the talent on the field, but I have to imagine that's maybe very underappreciated how much the team takes into consideration how a player will fit in the locker room and the dynamic and who the, the team captains and leaders are. Um, I'm sure that, you know, if you have a team where their their leaders are, you know, more veterans, that the type of players that would fit well in the locker room may be a bit different than a team whose leaders are more, you know, mid-20s or early 20s, for example. It's just something that it was another kind of one of those wild moments for me listening to you say it is because I never really truly appreciated how much the team considers um, chemistry when evaluating the player. Yeah, I, I you know, it's interesting I would probably steer more away from age and rather to contribution. Cause I'll tell you teams where the best player is the locker room leader generally do very, very well, you know, because you get that instant street cred with your team. I think it's really hard when your best leaders are role players or substitutes that do not contribute much because it's sort of like, well, that other guy who's performing at a higher output is kind of like off task. Like he's the one that's partying Saturday night. Like if he can do it, so can we. But when you have um, that, that the best player on your team who's sitting front and center at the team meetings and is taking notes and is the one that's asking questions and, and the one that's, you know, first to be in the, in the room last to leave or the guy that's doing extra sets and reps 
when everybody else isn't. Um, that that becomes really powerful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was when I was when you're talking about the combine, I was thinking about how how nerve wracking it is for for um, NFL prospects um, or college players for that matter to come to the combine and perform in front of professional teams. Right, like these are teams that they grew up watching on TV and stuff. For you yourself, when you started off as, as a psychologist in professional sports, did you have any of those kind of nervous emotions, or did you kind of have any anxiety when you first started off working with professional teams? <laughs> Uh, you mean, am I human? Yeah, yeah. I'm human. And, and, and so is everybody else. And I think it's really interesting because um, I think there's the reality and the fantasy, right? So I've, I've actually witnessed other sports psychologists who talk about like, oh, you would think I'd be nervous. Like I saw a presentation from a sports psychologist who's talking to a large room saying, you'd think I'd be nervous, but guess what? I'm not. I'm a sports psychologist as if his cape was sort of flapping in the background. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going, when did, when did psychologists stop becoming human? And so, um, I tend to take a different approach. And so maybe he he's not nervous or maybe he's overcome his anxiety. Like, you know what? I'll take him at face value. For me personally, I take a much more, um, what feels honest and true to me, a little bit more vulnerable, which is to say, yeah, like there are times where I get anxious. Yes, mm-hmm. there are times where I get frustrated and angry. There's times where I get depressed. Like, do any of them reach a clinical threshold? They don't. But um, I do have human emotion and human expression. And, you know, when I'm invested, it becomes amplified. So, you know, my job is important to me, not just for a sense of purpose, but also a sense of salvation. It, it, you know, it provides um, payment so I can pay the bills and the mortgage and make sure my kids, if they need braces and all those other Mm -hmm. kinds of things that we as human beings have to deal with. And so, yeah, I, I want to do a good job and that's important to me, but no different than Mm -hmm. you got to practice what you preach, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think what's interesting is sometimes we talk about emotions and it's almost like the recommendation is a surgical removal, like don't feel anxious. And I find that sometimes whether it's, just a friend consulting with a, a friend or a coach consulting with a player or somebody who's not receiving professional training. I think part of the removal or the desire to remove the emotion, don't be anxious, don't be depressed, don't be angry, is really our own discomfort with it. Like, I just don't want you to be depressed. I just don't want you to be angry. And so going back to it, for me, I try to take a more humanistic approach, which is to say, yes, From time to time, we all have feelings. And what we do with those feelings can be really impactful. If Martin Luther King Jr. doesn't get angry, I don't think he promotes change. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay to be angry. What you do with that anger is even more important. Right. It's It's a kind of whole notion of like forgetting your mistakes or forgetting about emotions versus accepting mistakes or accepting emotions. Like you, yeah, there's, there's value in accepting bad things happen. You, you get angry, you get sad. And the value in it is taking it as a learning experience and modeling for others, perhaps of how you're dealing with it. And they can take, you know, little tidbits from, from you, little tidbits from somebody else and then come up with their own approach potentially. Um, yeah, I mean, like just from a physiology standpoint, going back to the notion of anxiety, right? Like the physiology of anxiety and excitement are 100% identical heart rate increases, blood flow changes from, you know, going from your, you know, like your stomach and digestion process, more to the muscles, your eyes dilate, et cetera. Like, um, the only difference is what we label, right? Like anxiety is about a threat. Um, excitement's more about an opportunity. And so like I've been on the sidelines and a player has come up to me and going, Doc, I'm freaking out right now. I'm like, okay, that's good. That means like you're engaged. Like, all right, let's talk about what is going on. And we got to do it quickly because you're about to go back in the game. And can you channel this? I, you know, sometimes it's just about saying, because some people still do struggle with the terminology of emotion, right? And just, so I just say, look, if we talk about it as a mo- energy, you have energy right now. And if you can get that energy to kind of channel in the right direction, you can put it as an output that can be really powerful. Uh, A colleague of mine uh, who specializes more in the youth uses this great phrase um, 
It's about the butterflies in your stomach. And if you can get the butterflies to fly in the same direction, then you've got yourself a pretty powerful force. Um, I've never used the butterfly metaphor with an NFL player. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, it might resonate with some, I don't know, but mm -hmm. um, I like that idea of, you know what, feel the fear and do it anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking back as, as a sports psychologist yourself, and I know you mentioned growing up, you played some elite or high level uh, soccer growing up. Do you ever look back and, and maybe with regret or, or just, I guess, um, intuition or just, you know, just your general education have right now, do you ever look back and think, you know, maybe I should have done that differently or aha, uh -huh, like now I know why I did that when I played soccer. Like, do you kind of get those light bulb moments looking back as you were as a child? Um, yeah, I think I have some reflective moments. Uh, I find when that happens, it's more about the decisions that I made. Um, like when I decided to walk away from sport and, um, what that meant in my life. Um, and when I was less aligned with my sport, I think there are times we all get to a part of the grind of the season where it's like, man, I am really not interested in practicing today. And some of those, so I, I remember some of those kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I did tear my ACL. Oh, wow. So I did have one critical incident that required a huge roller coaster of emotions. But other than that, like, um, you know, the, uh, the, the successes and the failures of my own personal career, um, I wouldn't change for the world. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they help shape and define who I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, um, I think at the beginning when I first got into the sports psychology field, I looked back, started to look back and, and almost with a bit of regret or, or kind of like, I wish I did that differently. Like not so much, um, walking away from sports, but just, um, I guess the little things I did during the game, like for, for myself, for example, growing up playing hockey, um, at such a young age, there was opportunity for everybody on the team to kind of rotate playing goalie. And um, I didn't want to play goalie back then because I was scared of the puck. I was scared of getting hit with it, if it would hurt or something. And then I kind of look back now, I'm like, if I just knew what I knew now, maybe I could have played goalie when I was younger and who knew, who knows where that could have taken me, right? Um, but as with that, as I get more and more involved in the field, I learn different strategies. I then learn how to not be so, you know, regretting or regretful of the past and i learned to you know just just you know learn from it i guess and, and not dwell on it well but i think it's also interesting because it goes back to something you said earlier about accepting the positive and negative of all aspects of life mm -hmm. and it's possible that some of those moments that you had where you experienced anxiety as a goalie helped you develop and grow and understand certain things and you know just bring the conversation full circle we talked about sports being a microcosm to a macrocosm you navigating through those fears maybe helped you um, professionally navigate other moments mm -hmm. of stepping out of your comfort zone and mm -hmm. so um, you know <laughs> As Albert Ellis, the guy that trained me, as Albert Ellis used to talk about, he's like, you know, things are neither good nor bad. They just are. It's what we tell ourselves about them that gives them meaning and substance. And so I think it's really interesting because um, it's, it's like these uh, portraits of people's faces. Um, if it's just a, a straight up consistent face image, I don't think it's that interesting, but when it's something where you can really like see kind of like the scars and the distinguishing characteristics of that person's face, we go, wow, that's a really amazing portrait. Like mm -hmm. I, I think the broken nose and the bags under the eyes or the scar over the, the, the eyebrow, like those are the things that I think help make us who we are. Right, right. I like how you said uh, things are, are neither good or bad. And that's something that I'm starting to practice myself. And there was a, a little exercise, I guess, I learned in a book. It was called The Inner Game of Tennis. Because right now I'm trying to be competitive in tennis, enter tournaments. So I'm trying to, to navigate all of that. Of course, learning a new sport at a bit of a, an older age, mid-20s. And there's one exercise in the book where they talk about, again, being judgmental and looking at things as, as neither good or bad. And if you imagine a tennis match where you have two players, player A and player B, and player A hits a really good shot and gets a point for it. Well, player A looks at that as a good outcome or a good shot, and player B looks at that as a bad outcome. Mm 
Uh, but when you think about the, the umpire, the referee doesn't look at it as good or bad, but merely just scores the shot as it is. And so when I play tennis now, or, or any sport for that matter, um, competitively or recreational, I always try to take the approach of, of the referee or the umpire when looking at things and, and not looking at them as, as good or bad, but looking at them for what it is. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. It, you know, and, it, and I like the metaphor and the concept. I mean, there's also this element of, you know, you can't change the point, right? Like the point is that's, that's set, right. that's locked. And, and, the, and the point does have the potential to influence the next round, but in what way? Does it, does it influence emotionality? It could probably be good for it to be less so. Does it implement or augment the way you might strategize? Like, do you get more aggressive or do you play more conservatively? This is what makes sports so unbelievably complicated. And so I think um, – a similar thing that I'll mention to players is like, oh, that's just data. You know, oh, I just dropped that pass. All right. And then what happened? Well, and then we had to kick, you know, we had to punt on fourth down. Yep, that's true. These are all facts. Mm-hmm. Now, what does that mean? So this happened um, two years ago. A player dropped an important pass for first down and he came to me and said, man, you know, I blew it. And I said, right, you dropped the pass. And he was all up in his head about it. And I said, okay, now what does that mean? He's like, well, the team's going to lose. And I looked at the clock and I said, well, I I mean, there's still nine minutes left to be played. So do you think the game is over? He goes, no. And I go, okay. So I think that's a presumptive leap to think Mm -hmm. your dropped pass is going to cause the team to lose. He goes, yeah, but we're still down four points, which means we need a touchdown. And I go, yes. So your drop pass prevented that drive from going further. Yes, we're still down four points. Yes, we have seven minutes left in the clock. What does that mean in that moment? These are all data points. So it wasn't about discounting it or telling him cheer up or don't worry about it or anything. It was just, and what he kind of quickly processed was he said, okay, this means that the next opportunity I have, I really got to nail it. And I said, mm-hmm. okay, now what can you do to ensure or increase the likelihood of that success? And he said, well, I don't know. What do you got for me? I said, well, mm-hmm what were the critical or key elements that led to you dropping the pass? He goes, I turned my, he said, I rotated my neck before I secured the ball. I was looking downfield. I got too excited. I said, okay, so here's a positive emotion, excited, not anxious, but still counterproductive for him. I said, all right. So if you were to ask what's the critical element that you just learned, what's the key element that you just learned? He goes, yeah, I should make sure I secure the pass. So I go, okay. If or when the opportunity arises in the next seven minutes for you to make a key play, make sure you secure the pass before rotating your head. Did I get that right? He goes, yeah. I go, there you go. Now you've identified. You can let that past moment go. We gathered all the valuable data from it. We learned from it. Now we can get back to being in the present. And he went back out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting because part of my background as as a... um as part of my master's, it wasn't specifically in psychology. It was in a, a field similar to, I guess, under the domain of psychology, but it's called applied behavior analysis. And what it really focuses sure. on is uh, when you look, think of internal processes, um, how can we observe or measure them? And I really liked how you mentioned there with the, the athlete is, you know, turning the head was the behavior that, uh, turning the head too, too um, quickly or, yeah, too quickly, I think you mentioned that was the behavior that led to the drop pass. And there's an interaction between the emotion of the excitement and the behavior of turning the head and securing the pass. And, and that's something that I always like to try and focus with the athletes too, is yeah, yes, you have an emotional side of, of it, but the emotion leads to a behavior that, that was, um, that you didn't want to happen. For example, that was counterproductive, for example. So how can we come up with these observable and measurable behaviors that then give us a bit of insight on, on what what uh, role your emotions, I guess, are playing in the moment. Yeah. And just to piggyback on, I think an important part of applied behavioral analysis is remember they talk about thoughts as a behavior. Right. It's just a behavior that's measured by the one person who can accurately record them, which is the person who's having them. So when you go, Hey, I'm having these thoughts and these thoughts are behaviors. 
then the question is, are these productive thoughts? Are these productive behavior? Are the thoughts a productive behavior or are they a counterproductive behavior? So going, oh, my thought about dropping the pass and thinking I'm no good or we're going to lose the game, that doesn't serve me in any way. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes the question is, how does that serve you? The same way, um, you know, the way a jockey might, you know, uh, whip a horse to get it to run faster. If you're kind of, you know, crushing yourself a little bit, is that motivating you to be a little bit harder, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger? Okay, but let's tweak or figure out what is reinforcing about these thoughts and what's counterproductive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I think that's um, that's a great lesson because it's it's not only you know. In sport in general, we've obviously focused our much of our discussion on sport, but like we mentioned a bit at, at the beginning was these things apply to life in general. It's a, it's a 360 degree um, approach to, to just being a human. And, and sport, I think, is just one avenue for, for people to learn how to, to deal with these emotions and, and how to deal with these mental struggles uh, that can then help them in their whole life. Because again, athletes they only play sports for a limited amount of time you can't play sports for your whole life you have to retire at some point um, whether you play recreationally after that of course but in nfl there's not too many 50 year olds kicking around of course um, so to be able to kind of take these mental skills that you've learned in sport and apply them to life in general i think is such a huge huge skill for for people to have totally agree mm-hmm. anyway scott Really appreciate you kind of taking some time this morning, um, shared by your It was super, super eye-opening for me. A lot of things I had never considered or, or maybe considered in the wrong light that you, that you really kind of opened my eyes. I had a lot of wow moments. So I really appreciate you uh, sharing some of your knowledge. Yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity. Enjoy the conversation. It was enlightening for me as well.